Welcome to Advanced Machine Learning Tools for Engineers. In these segments, we're going to look at deep learning and convolutional neural networks. I'm going to be doing this myself, Matt Yedlin, and Mohammed Jafari, who is a graduate student in electrical and computer engineering. Mohammed, please introduce yourself. Hi, hi, uh, hi I'm Mohammed Jafari, and I'm a PhD student here at UBC. And we're happy to introduce to you these wonderful new topics, all the buzzwords, and all the wonderful things around deep learning. Next slide, please. I have a long history with neural networks going back to 1974. My first published paper was in the Journal of Experimental Neurology where I did work on the Purkinje layer in the cerebellum which controls movement. And uh, it's widely read and it was about electrical conductivity and you can see the Purkinje layer at the top of the diagram. It looks like a, a bit like a Christmas tree fairly complicated, there's only one cell. So you can see that even if you have a one or two cells, already you get a fairly complicated structure. Here's the outline of our talk. We're going to look at basic neurons, the idea of an artificial neural network, return to the basic neuron, introduce the perceptron with three different activation functions, and then extend the architecture to more complicated neural networks. Here's an example of a classic picture of a neuronal cell, and you can see the body of the neuron in, on the left, and it has an input side, which are the dendrites. The dendrites feed inputs into the neuron, and then when a threshold is reached, the nerve fires and sends a signal down an axon to its distal points. You can see them at the end on the right, and then the chemicals release. There's a synaptic connection to the next cell. So basically, you can see the basic input-output of one cell, and what we're going to do in the artificial case is connect a bunch of models of these cells to create our artificial neural network. Here's the basic idea. Uh, yes, so in terms of like uh, mathematical concepts, we would have some sort of input, maybe right here, and show that with x, and we would have an output and we will show that with y. And there would be some sort of mapping here. That basically, maybe I write down here, that uh, maps this input to output. What would be a simple, the simplest example of such a map? So basically it could be the identity. So x, y. And y so would just be equal to x, y right? Y equal to x. Yes. Well, that's pretty simple. How about a little more complicated? <laughs> um, maybe we can add some sort of weighting here. So x, w, and y. So basically, y equals to w, x. Well, that's pretty simple. We have a number here, a number here, and the two numbers are related by a simple weight, w. And in fact, as simple as it is, it's really the basis for understanding the very complex neural networks that we'll see in the following slides. Now let's return to our basic neuron as shown previously. Well, there's the basic neuron, and you can see that what we are going to do mathematically is we're going to change the activation on the output side. So the neuron is over there, and what we can do is model how it works. So the, there's three models that we're going to go through. The first one is a basic threshold model. When there's enough inputs, the cell will fire. So let's look at that one first. And I think we have some erasing to do, don't we? So let's clean the, the board quickly here. 
And this is one of the things about the light board is you have to do lots of erasing. So we'll see you in a couple hours. That's how long it usually takes. <laughs> right? Oh, it's, it's not a couple of hours. Well, that's good. It's done. So it's done. So there we have the basic neuron. And it has a bunch of inputs, as you can see. And they're all summed up. And then they feed an activation function, this function here, phi. And phi has different models. We start with the simplest. And if you look at the graph and the definition, if x is less than 0, you don't get any output. Phi is equal to 0. And if x is bigger than 0, we get 1. There's a problem here. What's the problem? The problem is that. Uh if you change the outputs by yeah. like uh, different values, uh, it, it won't reflect the input. So the, the point is this function is not as, as smooth. It's so, not smooth. So what do we do at x equals 0? Oh, that's another problem. <laughs> so what should we do? Yeah. You got an idea? I have an idea. I, I typeset the slide. I put it equal to a half. Yes, sometimes it, they just make it to be 1. Sometimes it could be just 0. But you like it to be I like zero it to be the average because if we take the average, it corresponds to the Fourier series definition. So on the right, it's 1. On the left, it's 0. The average of 1 and 0 is a half. It turns out it doesn't make a lot of difference. I've actually worked with this in time series. But the best choice is actually a half. Let's look at a smooth version of this. Well, this is a sigmoid function, so same idea. So we've basically taken the step function and smoothed it out. If you like, we bandpass filtered it and removed the jump. All right, the most current one that's used now that's, that's become very useful, and we'll see why sometimes there's a problem with sigmoid later on, is the following, as shown in the next slide. It's the rectified linear unit. You can see it. And it's 0 if x is less than 0. It's 0. It's continuous. And then it's linear and equal to x when x is greater than 0. Hmm. I'm a little confused, though, because if we try to refer back to our neuronal setup, the output's going to continue to go up. So this is really a different model, because we know that the neuron level doesn't increase as you give more inputs. So what this ReLU actually models is the firing rate as a code, as a modulation code encoding the neuronal information. And so as you get more signal, you get a more rapid firing rate. So that's kind of a, a bit of a hand-wavy argument. Now, this is one single cell with many inputs. Do you think we can generalize this? Let's look at the next slide. Holy smoke, that looks pretty complicated. Would you like to explain this? Uh, sure. So basically, if you have just uh, one neuron, something like this, even if you have like the most complicated active function here, we won't be able to do much, to do much with this just one neuron. So what, we, what we need to do is to have like multiple neurons, multiple inputs here, multiple types of relation from those inputs, and then we can have multiple outputs. outputs. So basically the building blocks of these neurons, these like complicated networks, are something like this. So the mapping really is created by putting this middle layer. I think they like to call it a hidden layer. I don't know why they call it hidden, because it looks like you can see it very well. But in terms of the final output, it's hidden. If you just look at the output, you don't know what's behind it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's right? So this is a fairly straightforward, and you can see the reference here from the uh, e-book by Michael Nielsen, and it's used for the recognition of written, handwritten characters. All right, that's still pretty simple. Let's look at this final picture. And 
Mohammed, maybe you could magnify it a bit. Wow, so this is just the beginning. We are not going to go through all the different types of networks, but you can see on the left, I count about 15 different network architectures. All architectures have different parameters that you have to set, so-called hyperparameters. So now we have a whole setup, and what we're going to explore, starting with the simplest case, is how this setup works to create complicated and applicable neural networks. Good work. <laughs> Thank you.